to the uh, eighth annual conference of the Harvard Program in Ethics and Health, which is a university-wide program that is focused on ethical issues that arise in respect to health at the population and global levels. Um, this program has uh, uh, looked in the past in its annual conferences at a very wide range of topics. I'm very happy to see that many of you here have been at several of those meetings. They've ranged from priority setting questions to studies of the ethical issues arising in the measurement of the global burden of disease, uh, 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 studies of the ethics of incentives and other means of uh, health promotion, and far beyond. And uh, on this occasion, this year, we are taking the widest possible view of global health and trying to ask some of the most fundamental ethical questions about global developments as we address the question of universal coverage in health systems, in, especially in the lowest income countries. And it's a, it's a great pleasure on this occasion to collaborate uh, even more uh, broadly than we have in the past with uh, colleagues who work primarily in development and in various avenues of global health, as well as those who have specialized in the study of ethical issues. My name is Dan Wickler, and um, I'm, I've been a co-director of this uh, uh, conference, along with Dr. Ulla Norheim, if you'll stand up. And uh, Dr. Norheim is an Ethiopian um, native. Uh, is literally true. I'll explain that in just a moment, <laughs> uh, which uh, adds to his qualifications for, uh, for directing this conference. And uh, we have on hand many of our colleagues uh, at Harvard who work in ethics and also who work in global health. And and others throughout the world. Uh, the uh, occasion for this conference was uh, the prospect of holding a meeting, an, uh, one of several meetings, of a consultative group that was uh, appointed by the World Health Organization for uh, uh, advice and the guidance on ethical issues arising in, uh, in universal coverage planning. Uh, Dr. Nurheim has been involved in this, as have I and several of the others who you will hear from this morning. And we thought it would be advisable to hold one of the meetings here at Harvard where so many of the people who are working on this um, are, are, uh, are employed. And um, given that we had this uh, range of uh, expertise coming in for the meeting, we thought we'll hold the public meeting uh, that would uh, share the agenda with uh, a broader audience and, and benefit from the remarks by others going into this meeting. So uh, for those of us who are involved in the consultative group, um, all of this is a learning experience. We'll be listening very intently to what all of you have to teach us. Uh, the last hour or half hour of this conference uh, will involve uh, uh, the uh, uh, introduction to members of the committee who are present, uh, some of whom will have some remarks. and then in the next two days after this conference, uh, that group will go into, into their uh, deliberations. Uh, those of you who are here have undoubtedly seen the um, diagram that's on all of our posters and on the program. Uh, it's a now famous cube that was presented um, uh, by the World Health Organization. This was uh, the brainchild of uh, Dr. David Evans, um, who is um, a ranking economist, health economist at WHO who was the principal author of the 2010 World Health Report that gave much of the impetus to uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, current uh, worldwide movement to actually bring uh, universal coverage plans into actuality, even in places in which this had been thought to be a very distant prospect. Uh, Dr. Evans can't be with us today, unfortunately, uh, but has uh, uh, supported us throughout, and we're very grateful to him for his guidance and his help and encouragement uh, in, in all of this. Um, Dr. Evans's cube uh, it was designed to make transparent some of the most pressing ethical issues that have to be addressed in any attempt to achieve universal coverage in, uh, in a, uh, uh, a country at any level. Uh, these pinpoint some of the most difficult trade-offs and the unavoidable trade-offs that are involved and uh, uh, the, the cube brilliantly does this. It shows that if one has the aspiration of achieving universal coverage in a health system, you have to decide 
in what respect and to what degree you will achieve universality in each of these axes. So the first, of course, is who will be covered? Who will have uh, be covered in the health plan? Um, you can ask temporally who will be covered first, but in general, who will be targeted uh, when your vision is achieved? The second thing is uh, which services, which products, and uh, which benefits of the health system will be covered because it might be possible to achieve universality in the sense of inclusion of everyone, but only for a very narrow range of the benefits that a health system can provide. Or you can, you can have as an aspiration the fastest uh, expansion of that range of benefits uh, as possible. And you can also ask what the limits should be. And then finally, this is a question of the degree to which the universal system, universal coverage, will lift the burden of immediate cost from the individual. So when a person needs care, how much of the cost of that care has to be borne by the individual and how much of it can be covered by the system? So uh, each of these can be traded off against the other. Uh, and we will, we've sort of organized our program, sorry, we've organized our program around these three different axes that are identified in the cube. But many of the most difficult ethical issues um, arise still further down in the road in our deliberations. First of all, we realize that it's hard even to define one of these questions without taking uh, notice of where you are on some of the others. And also, most especially, if we're concerned about the principal ethical issue, which is equity, whether or not uh, there's a way of uh, clearly identifying the most important ethical questions to be kept in mind, most important ethical objectives to be kept in mind, to achieve the maximum amount of equity that's possible with any solution to these conundrums, to, to these uh, triple um, trade-off dilemmas. Are there, is there one class of people? Is there one kind of service? Is there one level of burden that's most important to achieve or to cover, to address, so that we can have as much equity as it's possible to have given our aspiration to have universal coverage and given what are in these countries inevitably a terribly um, uh, 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 low level of, uh, of uh, resource, out, uh, resource um, uh, availability. It's the, the fact that we're trying, that all of these countries are trying to achieve something quite marvelous with very, very little that makes all these ethical dilemmas so acute. So over the next uh, two days, we're going to look at this from uh, two dozen angles. And we hope that by the end of this, um, we'll have a little bit more clarity on what it is that we consider ethically most important to keep in mind. So I will uh, now just introduce uh, Ula very briefly, and um, uh, we'll then turn to our keynote speakers. And um, uh, Ula, as I mentioned, is an Ethiopian native. He, he's not an Ethiopian citizen, but he was born in Ethiopia. Uh, his uh, career has been spent in Norway, where uh, he is um, uh, has uh, trained as a clinician and has been working as a, a physician in Norway, but also periodically in Ethiopia. Uh, his uh, interest turned quickly to uh, global health, especially the health in the uh, poorest countries of the world, of which Ethiopia remains one. And uh, he has been a colleague of ours here in our Harvard group for many years, sp uh, periodically spending time with us. We look forward to his participation in our research and teaching uh, agenda uh, for the uh, fall semester of this year and the coming year. Uh, Dr. Uh, Norheim was the past president of the International Association on, uh, for the Study of Priority Setting in Healthcare, title approximate, and has been an active participant in such a wide range of uh, projects at WHO and uh, in bioethics and in uh, uh, global, uh, global medicine that uh, the list would take to, uh, most of the morning to recite. So with that, I'll ask Bill to speak. Uh, thank you, Dan. So what I will do is uh, just to introduce um, nine questions that we have been discussing in our discussions for the WHO guidance uh, for uh, how to move towards uh, universal cover coverage, how to 
progressively realize this ideal and many issues will arise uh, when governments make these choices. So I think some of you might think that uh, universal coverage and financing has nothing to do with ethics. Uh, I will try to show that it has something to do and I think it's fitting here at this university where John Rawls developed his theory of fairness and Amartya Sen developed his theory of development as freedom that we think about the issues related to fair distribution of financial protection, that's one objective of uh, universal coverage, and fair distribution of health, uh, another objective. And also, of course, uh, maximizing health and maximizing well-being in society. So these are the core issues of uh, uh, theories of justice and fairness, and this is what we think uh, ethics is about. But we will discuss these lofty ideals and abstract concepts. So I, I thought I would uh, uh, show you four pictures of four patients from Ethiopia. To be very concrete, to start uh, with a, uh, at the floor, so to speak. Uh, so this is from the E ward in Arba Minch in uh, southern Ethiopia, uh, in a district hospital where I worked. And I asked these patients for permission to show their face. So this patient had uh, TB and uh, developed AIDS and he had uh, treatment for that. And in Ethiopia, t thanks to PEPFAR and a lot of overseas development aid, coverage in Ethiopia is about 56% for those who need uh, ARTs, those with CD4 counts below 350 or with symptoms. So. It's remarkable, in, even in this poor country, that you have such a coverage for this treatment. For children needing antibiotics with suspected pneumonia, in Ethiopia, coverage is below 10 percent. Uh, for people with hypertension uh, that, could prevent, uh, that need treatment that could prevent stroke and cardiovascular disease, coverage is even lower, far below 10%. And it's not part of the essential package in Ethiopia. Uh, High-risk mothers uh, who need skilled personnel, uh, they don't give birth at institutions in Ethiopia. The figure, the coverage is below, or it's exactly 10%, according to the latest uh, DHS. But the coverage is also skewed. So if you look at the Lorentz curve here, where you have the uh, wealth quintiles on the x-axis, you can see that it's quite uh, uh, unevenly distributed. So in the highest quintile, about 45% of women give birth having a skilled attendance present, while in the lowest quintile, it's below 2%. So it's moving from this situation is both improving the average, of course, and also uh, reducing these disparities. And if we look at uh, the financial side of it, uh, Ethiopia, as many other countries, uh, see also that some people are pushed into poverty or have to spend high amounts of uh, their income on uh, health care expenses. So these are also uh, important aspects of why we need to move towards universal coverage. So I think having this background, uh, some of the questions concerning fairness are, are quite easy, I would say. Not something that you philosophers and other ethicists will think is, is very hard. So I put this up first. Is it fair that people pay large uh, proportion of the cost for key services, for pneumonia treatment, for having a skilled birth attendant there? Uh, I would say no. Uh, we can justify it, we can argue it, but it's, I, I mean it's fairly simple. Is it fair that coverage is far below 100% for so many key services? Is it fair, and this is a little bit more tricky, is it fair that some citizens have access to open heart surgery, for instance, advanced care, while others do not have access to key priority services, like treatment for pneumonia? And again, I think the simple answer is no, it's not fair. 
The hard questions are those related to the cube and the different dimensions here. So should government reduce direct payments or expand services? So more concretely, like in Ethiopia, should they reduce co-payment for antihypertensives? Most patients pay that out of pocket. Uh, should they do that first or should they improve uh, uh, or should they expand services to, to more services to start with open heart surgery in Ethiopia or liver transplants? Should governments include more people or expand services? And I, I think that's, uh, in theory, I think the answer is simple. In practice, we see that all governments want to expand services, not only having primary care services, they want to have secondary services and a lot of tertiary services as well. So that's a practical dilemma, a political dilemma. Uh, theoretically, I, I think we, we would all agree that we should first start with including more people, but in practice that doesn't happen. And is that unfair? Should governments include more people or reduce direct payments? So these are the hard trade-offs that we will discuss during this conference. And then there are finally three even harder questions. So. What criteria for including more people for key services when the coverage is low? Should governments prioritize the sickest, the poor, the marginalized, people in prison not getting TB treatment, those hard to reach that are living in rural areas? Or should they think like they usually do, including first civil servants, military personnel, the labor force, the farmers, the unemployed last? How should we think about the movement going from low coverage towards universal coverage? And then the second question that's really hard, how to rank and choose key services. Uh, the idea of universal coverage makes no sense, I think, if we do not define some key services. Ethiopia will never reach universal coverage for all possible services. Well, not never, but not in that next 20 years. So they have to define key services. And should they define them according to cost effectiveness only? Uh, what about priority to the worse off? What about financial risk protection? And I think all these three uh, concerns have to be integrated to define key priority services for which there should be universal coverage. And finally, it should be number three. For which patients group should direct payments for key services be reduced first? That's kind of the key question for universal coverage. Should we give priority to those in the lowest income quintiles? That could look like the most obvious answer. Or should we in reduce co-payment for everyone? That would be the Nordic answer. Uh, how we think in Scandinavia that universal coverage is about including everyone so that we have the support from everyone. So these are my few thoughts uh, and I hope this question will resonate with you during the conference and I hope you will give us advice back at the end of the conference for the WHO panel on who will develop further the ethical guidance towards uh, universal coverage. Thank you.